Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening, my name is Tony Cully Foster and I have the honor of serving as the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. World Affairs Council, D.C. is a non-profit and non-partisan organization dedicated to facilitating co collaboration throughout the global education and international affairs community. We do this by developing inform geopolitical insights and critical thinking with a global perspective, and providing programs to educate, enlighten, and empower students, educators, professionals, the American public, and international community. Our tagline is, we're an organization where learning happens. That's the reason for this gathering tonight. We're sharing knowledge, which is not power, the use of knowledge is power. And the lady who's going to speak as our VIP tonight will not be shy about imparting her knowledge and her views about the subject matter at hand. On behalf of the Council's Board of Directors, we welcome you to tonight's author series program. We thank our strategic partners at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for their wonderful hospitality and the provision of a beautiful venue to hold our public programs. All of our programs are filmed for nationwide broadcast on our one hour weekly television show, World Affairs Today, which airs at 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoons on MHC Network's Worldview Channel. The programs are also distributed globally on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and other digital platforms. Today's event will focus on Ms. Jade Wu, author of the book, Flashpoints, Lessons Learned and Not Learned in Malawi, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The United States currently is managing foreign assistance programs in more than 100 countries around the globe. These programs are mainly delivered by organizations like USAID, U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. State Department, and cumulatively, they have an annual budget of $42 billion. They fund and organize programs with the aims of promoting global security, sustainable societies, poverty reduction, and economic growth. They often operate in regions that are underdeveloped or have experienced conflict and development challenges. All of these international aid programs are well-intentioned and part of a global U.S. soft diplomacy focus. Inevitably, some of these initiatives have been more successful than others. Tonight, Ms. Wu will explore some of the successes and failures that she has directly experienced in connection with U.S. foreign assistance programs and explain how we can learn from on-the-ground experiences to enhance our nation's ability to produce the desired results through international economic development, soft diplomacy, and civil society support from the United States. Our author is currently a lawyer and county prosecutor with a degree from the California Western School of Law. Ms. Wu's first involvement in foreign assistance programs was when she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malawi teaching English. She later was a disaster relief coordinator in Kosovo during the Serbian-Albanian crisis. She has also worked as a humanitarian aid advisor in Germany. Ms. Wu serves as a member of the Office of General Counsel at the Asian Development Bank in the Philippines. She worked to further the cause of education in Iraq and sought to increase the rule of law in Afghanistan through capacity building. 
Ms. Wu has spoken to various foreign affairs and community service organizations, including the International Men and Women's Club of America, the Naples, Florida Council on World Affairs Model United Nations, and Rotary International. Her analysis of foreign policy issues has been featured in the New York Times, International Herald Tribune, Chicago Tribune, Baltimore Sun, The Hill, and Foreign Policy Journal. So please join me in welcoming our author, all the way from California, Jade Wu, to our World Affairs Council podium tonight. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Many times when we Americans work overseas, we're mainly focused on the local people's words and actions. Why do they do what they do? Why do they say what they say? And why aren't they taking to our programs as quickly and as efficiently as we would like? But how many of us Americans are focused on our own words and behavior? How many of us are sensitive to the fact that what we do and what we say are equally essential to the success of our programs and the US's image? Flashpoints, lessons learned and not learned in Malawi, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan is about American words and behavior in US foreign assistance projects. That no matter how small, how insignificant, whether you are on the clock or off the clock, what you say and what you do, how you behave matters. It matters in how the local people perceive you, where the local people believe you, whether they trust you, how they perceive your group of American colleagues, your program, and eventually the US. I wanna give you a few scenes from my book that talk about this. They take place in four of the six countries I worked in on US foreign assistance projects. And have you think about what are the teaching points here? What are the bigger implications? And most importantly, whether the lesson was learned or not. About two decades ago, I was this young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, over-energetic Peace Corps volunteer. I applied for Peace Corps, they accepted me, and they said to me, Jade, we're gonna send you to Malawi, and you're gonna teach English to secondary school students. I didn't even know where Malawi was. So for those of you who can't immediately picture where Malawi is off the top of your head, think of the continent of Africa. Think of the southernmost country, South Africa. Go up north about two countries. Right there is the skinny vertical landlocked country of Malawi. It is agriculture, it is poverty stricken, and an HIV hotbed. So the days prior to flying out to Malawi, I was here in Washington, D.C. with my group of 120 volunteers. We were going through training. The Peace Corps being very organized, they were giving us days and days of PowerPoint sessions. They gave us everything from cultural lessons to language lessons to even hygiene lessons. But the one thing that Peace Corps did not warn me of, did not alert me of, did not train me on, happened to me the first day I walked into my first class at Lunzu Secondary School. I remember walking into the school that day and I was told it's a government funded school and thinking as I saw the broken windows, it's not very well funded. And as I walked into the classroom, many of the desks were mangled. As I looked out into the sea of faces, I saw 80, eight zero students. They were all black, they all had short, dark, curly hair, and they all wore the same school uniform. I couldn't tell one kid from the next. And as most teachers did on the first day of school, I did introductions. So the, school, the, the kids told me a little bit about themselves and I told them a little bit about me. I said, 
I was raised in Los Angeles. I have one brother, and I like playing the piano. Now, the kids were very interested when they heard that I was raised in Los Angeles because they wanted to know more about Hollywood and whether I knew Tom Cruise. Then I saw this kid all the way in the back. He had his hand half raised like this. I said, you, you have a question? Stand up and speak up. This kid stood up and suddenly the whole class fell silent. This kid looked at me and said, Madam, we have heard rumors that Chinese people eat people. Do you eat people too? I was completely flabbergasted. I was, I was completely tongue-tied. All I could think of was, hey, I came here to help these kids, not eat them. Is this what they think of me? So how did I answer that question? Well, being young and inexperienced in many things at that time in life, I decided to take a chance. So I looked out into the sea of faces and I said, you all have been way too noisy, just way too noisy today. As soon as I stepped in this morning, you're jumping up and down and you're talking. If you don't all sit down and be quiet, I'm going to gather you all up like this and put you in a huge boiling pot. Immediately, the whole room broke out in laughter. The ice was broken. I was lucky. Several weeks later, I was sitting in my house at Lunzu Secondary School, looking over the two books that I was given the first day I arrived, given to me by the headmaster. One was a grammar book, and the other one was a Malawian literature book, written by Malawian authors in English. As I was flipping through the literature book, which I had flipped through many times before that night, I noticed something that I hadn't noticed before. And the story went like this. Two Malawians, very good people, but very poor, went to sleep one night. And when they woke up in the middle of the night and looked in the mirror, they were surprised, pleasantly surprised to find that they had become white. They had become Caucasians. And when they came out into the living room, into their kitchen, they saw all new state-of-the-art appliances, new refrigerator, new stove, new microwave. When they looked out the window, they saw a brand new car waiting for them to drive. The gist of the story was, if you were good, you would wake up white and rich. I put down this book and I thought, how am I gonna teach this? Not to mention the complication of having me teach it since I'm not white or black. Does this mean I'm a little bit good and a little bit bad? Or does it mean that I didn't make the successful transformation to whiteness, I got stuck somewhere in between and came out the color I am? We have to understand the background of these students. Many of them come from agricultural families. Many of them, they'd be lucky if their parents had more than a primary education. They would be lucky if they had a television and or a radio in their homes. And something like a daily newspaper in their villages was virtually non-existent. What these kids knew to be truths in life, what they knew to be reality, was based on what they saw with their own eyes, what their families taught them, what their communities told them, and what their teachers taught them. I just couldn't see how I could stand up in front of the class knowing this about my students and teach a, a story that not only emphasized their lack of poverty, uh, that emphasized their lack of opportunity, but one which also made derogatory statements about their skin color. So not knowing what to do as a young teacher, I just skipped over it. But understand, I had a curriculum. I had dates and a schedule to follow. And these kids would be having a national exam at the end of the school year. So as weeks pass, and I continue to skip over the story, skip over the story, things finally came to a head when I had to face the department head at the school who, had to, who asked me why I didn't teach that. So I went in, I told him, and he looked at me. 
And I said, sir, I can't teach this knowing the unsophistication of my students and how it would affect them. And I think it would reflect poorly on the teaching profession, also the values of Peace Corps. He looked at me and finally he said, okay, I was lucky again. Fast forward 10 years later, I was hired on another English teaching program, this time to Baghdad, Iraq. And this time, instead of kids being my students, my students were now gonna be the government employees in Prime Minister Nor al-Maliki's office. I remember flying into Iraq, being driven into Baghdad, into the green zone, put on a one acre compound. And as I got situated in the program and started teaching my courses, it wasn't the Iraqis that caught my attention, but the behavior of the Americans on the compound. One day, between classes, I was taking a break. I remember this. I was uh, eating a cookie, and I was walking down the hallway. And I saw my colleague, Stanley Smith, standing in the hallway, too, right outside his office. And he had this really grumpy look on his face, and his arms were crossed, like this. And so I walked up to him. I said, Stan, what's going on? Why are you standing here right outside your office? He said, why? Look, he pointed into his office, the door was open. So I stuck my head in to take a peek as to what's going on. When I looked in the room that he was pointing to his office, I saw six Iraqis, local staff in the room. They had their prayer mats out and they were praying. Apparently Stan's office, which had formerly been a storage place, what had an unobstructed view toward Mecca. And the Iraqi staff had been using that room to be praying all along. But none of us Americans on the compound had focused on this. So Stan looks at me and he says, you know, I was really accommodating the first week when I arrived here, but this is happening every day and several times a day. I have a schedule to follow. I've got reports to write. I've got phone calls to return. This is too much. Then Stan sticks his head into the room and shouts, hurry up. As I tiptoed away from Stan that afternoon, I thought to myself, who's right and who's wrong in this situation? Is there a right and wrong in the situation? If we take sides, Let's say we take the sides of the Iraqis. We can say, this is Iraq. We Americans know that Iraqis pray. We should be more sensitive to their needs. And besides, those Iraqis had been using that room well before Stan ever showed up. Stan should be more sensitive to their needs. But if we take the side of Stanley, we might say, wait a minute. This is an American compound funded by American money, and that office was given to Stan. He has work to do. Can't those Iraqis pick up their mats and go somewhere else to pray? They can face Mecca even if a room did not. Then the term cultural sensitivity came to my mind. Each time I worked overseas, that term gets pulled out and used, but nobody ever actually defined it for me. Does being culturally sensitive mean one side accommodates and adjusts? Or does it really mean that both sides accommodate and adjust to each other? In 2011, because I'm a lawyer, I was hired on a rule of law program in Afghanistan. I remember being flown into Kabul and put on this huge, 10 acre compound called Newport with many offices, sleeping rooms, cafeterias, and rec room. As I got situated on Newport and started doing my rule of law program, I noticed who the inhabitants on Newport were. They were mainly made up of two groups. One was the American group and the other was the Afghan group. The American group, which ranged about 150 to 200 in number, were made up of civilian and military. They worked for different employers and they lived there. 
The Afghan group, which ranged from 40 to 60 in number, they were made up of our local staff and our rule of law students, and they didn't live there, they commuted. So as I started teaching my classes, I saw that outside of working in the offices, working together in the programs, the two groups never mixed. They didn't socialize off duty. Obviously they cannot socialize out of the compound because we Americans have a safety issue, but even on the compound, they didn't mix. For example, at 10.45 a.m. on the compound every day, we had a 15 minute break. And usually the people who lived on the compound, they would either go to the rec room or they would go to their sleeping rooms. The rec room had Scrabble, Monopoly, DVD player, and ping pong. But I noticed that whenever the Americans were in that room, none of the Afghans were. And vice versa, when the Afghans were in that room, none of the Americans were. Same thing for lunch. We had two main dining facilities on the compound, the International Defect, which served a buffet at every meal, had higher quality food, and the Afghan Defect, which served one entree per meal and had lower quality food. The general rule on the compound was, if you're an American, you can go to either one. But if you're an Afghan of any rank, you were relegated to the Afghan defect. And from time to time, I would hear the Afghan staff complain about the food when we're sitting in the office. So looking at this lack of socialization and realizing we're in a war zone, I thought, how is this helping our program? As many of you know, for those of you who've worked overseas, our well-being and the success of our programs overseas it depends on the quality of staff, and so much more so when you're in a war zone, when we Americans are dependent on our translators, our subject matter experts, our drivers, our security officers, because they accompany us into the town, into the villages, they introduce us to local officials. But I wasn't seeing that bonding on the compound. So one day, I decided to approach one of the managers on the compound and ask him why we have this curious arrangement. So I went to him and I asked him and I said, sir, I'd understand uh, in terms of the separation of defects, if, if you're saying that the, for, the, for the students, they get their own defect because of their, their, their different rank, but shouldn't our staff be given the choice? This man, an American, he looked around, huffed and puffed, and he said, there are many reasons, but it's mainly about costs. And then he walked away. Okay, so I thought about what he said, mainly about costs. And I thought, well, this is a very non-committal answer. And it's not really explaining anything. By the year 2011, how much money and lives has the US spent in Afghanistan alone? And we're concerned about a couple of feeding a couple of Afghans on our compound. Subsequently, I heard other rumors. Well, there's differences in cuisine and there's a security problem. Okay, differences in cuisine. Now, since nobody really explained it to me, I'm thinking we're referring to pork, because as you know, Muslims don't consume pork and we sometimes served it in the international defect. But shouldn't our Afghan staff be the ones to make that choice. Then the security issue. Okay, every compound that I went into in Afghanistan, when the Afghans come in, they are searched at the gate before they are allowed in. In the evening, when they're leaving, they're searched at the gate again before they're allowed to go. Once the Afghan is in the compound, he's in. If he wants to do harm, he doesn't have to wait until he goes into the cafeteria to do anything. So the security issue really wasn't explaining it either. So without answers, I was subsequently rotated to Kunduz province. And for those of you who can't picture where it is off the top of your mind, it is in the north of Afghanistan, bordering Tajikistan, northeast part. It is very rural and very dangerous. It, you, some of you might remember in the year 2015, it is also the same province where our US aircraft dropped a bomb on the Doctors Without Borders hospital, killing and injuring a number of people. 
When I got to Kunduz, I was driven into the Kunduz Regional Training Center, also known as the Kunduz RTC. It was huge, over 10 acres, many buildings. But I noticed that the inhabitants on this compound were much more numerous. We had 750 men and one woman. Okay, of the 750, about 50 to 60 were the expats, made up of Americans, Belgians, Croatians, Germans, Russians, Filipinos, Nepalese, and they were civilian and military. The rest of the population were the Afghans. They were mainly Afghan police trainees because the main purpose of the compound was to train police. We also had 50 rule of law students that were in my program. And they, along with the police trainees, they, in, they lived on the compound during their courses. But our Afghan staff, they didn't live there. They commuted, and they were about 40 to 60 in number. If I had thought that the separation, the segregation thing on Newport was bad in Kabul, it was even more acute on the Kunduz RTC. For example, not only did we have the two separation of defects issue, we also had a road that ran through the compound, not directly down the middle, but it ran through the compound from one point to the other point. And I was told, this is the unofficial dividing line between the international side and the Afghan side. And then I noticed there was a basketball court and a volleyball court. But just like the rec room at Newport, when the Americans were using it, none of the Afghans were there. When the Afghans were using it, none of the Americans were there, except the Americans were running this compound. So one day, I went to one of my rule of law courses, and that day I remember because my colleague was teaching the class and I was told to go there and observe him. So as I walked into the class, my colleague is standing in the front teaching, we had about 50 Afghan students sitting in the room, and then two Afghan staff being teacher aides. I sat in the back to observe. At that moment, my colleague standing in front of the class was talking about the concept of equality. Equality of the races, equality of the genders. I looked at my watch. It was 11.55 a.m. In about five minutes time, we would break for lunch. And in five minutes time, we did. Immediately, you could see all the expats going this way and all the Afghans of any rank going that way. It was difficult to practice what we preached. But just a minute ago, we were talking about equality. To the international community's credit, in the winter of 2012, there was a mandate that came down from above to all the RTCs across Afghanistan, and it went like this. From henceforth, you will allow your Afghan staff the choice of eating in the international defect. I was present when this announcement was made to the expat community in the Kunduz RTC. Immediately, there were dissenting voices coming from the American side, and it was interesting to to listen to what these guys were saying. One gentleman from Kentucky stood up and he said, in front of everyone, I don't understand why the Afghan staff have to be allowed into our cafeteria. They don't have the same sense of hygiene. They pick up their food with their hands. It's not clean. You know, if you allow them in, I won't be coming in anymore. I'm gonna have my wife send me food through the APO. Another gentleman from Atlanta, Georgia, he said, okay, I work all day with Afghans. Meal times are the only time I get a break away from them. Do you have to let them in when I'm eating? I don't want to see them when I'm eating. Now, the compound manager, another American, to his credit, he stood up and said, okay, I have heard everyone speak tonight who wishes to speak. I understand everyone in this room is not happy. 
But this is a mandate coming down from above, so we will enforce it, and it will start this coming Monday. But then the manager said something very interesting, as if to pacify the dissent. He said, well, since the international defect is not so big, and we cannot allow everyone in there all at once at the same time, we're going to make a slight modification. And it's going to be like this. Starting Monday, the lunch hour will be from 11 to 1. If you're an expat, you can enter any time that period. But if you're an Afghan staff, you can enter starting only at 12 noon. Monday came, and the new policy was enforced. At 11 AM, the majority of the expats on the Kunduz RTC went in to the international defect, got their lunches, ate it, and left. By the time 12 noon arrived, the international defect essentially became an Afghan dining hall. It was difficult to practice what we preached. It was also clear that the, the, the expat community particularly on this compound, they were not interested in finding out who the local people were. They were just working with them. If you think about it, you have to wonder, what has America been doing in Afghanistan all these years? Or ask the bigger question, why is the US in any foreign country? I firmly believe that the US is in any foreign country to defend, protect, and advance US national interests. If we take that reasoning and apply it to Afghanistan, there are many in our government who believed that defending and protecting and advancing US national interests involves that country of Afghanistan becoming a working democracy. But in order for that to happen, we're gonna need the Afghan population to support democratic institutions as well as democratic concepts, one of which is the core value of equality. If we cannot demonstrate that concept to them on their soil, how can we expect them to embrace that value among others? My last example, which ends us on a lighter note, takes us back to Baghdad, Iraq. And it's not really about American words and actions so much as it is about how many of us have fixed ideas about other cultures. And it affects the way we perceive them and how we interact with them. Towards the end of my stay in Baghdad, I was teaching class one day and one of my students said, Jade, we know you're not gonna be here forever. We know you're gonna leave one day very soon. So is there something in Baghdad you'd like to do that you haven't done yet? Because maybe we could help you. I thought, okay, that's very generous. So I said, oh yes, there are many things in Baghdad that I would have liked to have done, but I couldn't. Actually, there are many places in all of Iraq I would have liked to have visited, but because of security problems, I couldn't go. But there is one thing you could help me with. I would like to go with one of you to a local mosque to observe prayers one afternoon. Is that possible? Now my students, knowing that I'm not Muslim, they were actually very open about it. And they talked amongst each other. And finally, the female student, Noor, her name is spelled N-O-O-R, she stood up and she said, Oh, I go pray at a mosque not too far from here. Let me talk to my imam and I'll get back to you. I remember the day when Noor and I drove up in her car to her mosque in Baghdad. It was an exceptionally hot day. I spent some time living in Phoenix, Arizona. I thought I knew what hot was. I also spent some time in Manila, Philippines. I thought I knew what hot was. But oh no, Baghdad, July, midsummer, I'm talking 129 Fahrenheit. It was exceptionally hot. Not to mention that day, because I'm going to a mosque, I was covered in head to toe in cloth. I remember my, my collar was up to my neck. My sleeves were 
up to my wrists and my slacks were down to my ankles. So I was, sweat I was really sweating bullets. So as I'm struggling to get out of Noor's car, I see out of the corner of my eye, the imam is coming out of the mosque in his elegant white gown and walking toward me. He approached me and he said, are you our guest today? Because if you are, you're most welcome. Now, I wasn't exactly expecting to be met by the imam. Likely, Noor had something to do with it. But I also wasn't expecting that he would speak such good English. So we followed him up the steps, took off our shoes, and entered. Once inside, I saw rows and rows of people getting ready for prayer, the men in the front and the women in the back. And the imam turned to me and he said, did you bring a camera? Because if you brought a camera, you're most welcome to take any number of pictures you like, even while we're praying. Then he went to the front and took his position and prayer started. Because I'm a woman, I have to be all the way in the back. So as I'm watching the men in the front and the women in the back, everyone was, they stood, they knelt all the way down to the ground, they bent all the way forward, their foreheads touched the ground, and then they stood up and they went through the steps over and over again. So after watching this as the egalitarian American, I turned to Nora and I said, Nor, why are the men in the front? Why can't the women be in the front? We in this mosque are all praying. I was completely expecting her to give me a cultural and religious reason. Instead, Nor turned to me and she said, why? Look, do you not see how they're praying? Everyone is standing, kneeling all the way to the ground, bending all the way forward, foreheads touch the ground, their behinds go straight up into the air. Do you think it would be a really good idea for rows and rows of women in the front with their buttocks sticking up and the men in the back watching? They won't be able to concentrate. They won't be able to pray. You need to think. You need to open your eyes. You need to be practical. Okay, she really put me in my place that day. Like many Americans, we have, we have fixed ideas about other, other cultures and why they do what they do. And in this case, when we see people praying in the mosque, we think, okay, they pray like that, and the women are in the back because they're subordinate in the culture anyway, and there's probably cultural and religious reasons for that. And while m much of that may be true, we're not thinking beyond that. We're not thinking, could there be another reason that we're not thinking of, that we don't know about? And in this case, there is. There was a practical reason, a modesty issue. And it was so obvious that many of us missed it. And it took an Iraqi woman to point this out. Many of us need to open our eyes and be more sensitive to our words and actions. Thank you. Okay, it's, it's uh, time for a question and answer. Since you've seen so much, it sounds like a lot of what you've come to, you come to conclusions that create questions. Uh, maybe even criticisms of American culture. What's the solution? Do you address that in your book? Or do you have any anecdotes on how you fix these things? Because I assume that you don't do any of these things that you blame other Americans for in terms of being insensitive. So what is it that you did that makes you exceptional? And what would be the handbook for an approach that we should take? Okay, nice meeting you, Todd. Actually, uh, in my book, I do talk about me being the ignorant American hopefully not the ugly American from the 1958 book, but I was also an American who did a lot of these things. And I didn't realize that I was doing them until I was on my second or third country abroad. So far, I've worked in six. And I wrote this book because it started being more and more apparent to me that the same behavior was going on from one country 
to the next. A lot of ignorance, a lot of looking away, a lot of not speaking up, a lot of not rocking the boat because we want to keep our jobs, we want to make our programs look good, we want to get our contracts renewed, and so we sort of brush over the things that we don't like, and, or we sh hush up and we don't talk about them. Actually, when I first got to Afghanistan, and I say this in my book, I was pulled aside by an American colleague, a fellow lawyer, and he said to me, Jade, I got some advice for you. I tell this to every American who lands here. If you see something, you lie low and keep your head down. You don't say anything. That became the unofficial golden rule among us among the crowd of Americans I worked with and the Americans that I lived with. And I thought, how is this, how is this good for our programs? It's, it is those of us who are worker bees overseas that see things that could give suggestions as to how to improve programs. If we don't speak up, if we don't tell our supervisors what's going on, how could that program improve? And then there were some problems with the supervisors too because the supervisors also want to have the contract renewed. They also want the program looking good. They also want the, the reports to Congress looking good. So there, this, this is a systemic problem that's happening over and over again. And I say in my book that I hope that many organizations will have a dissent channel because a lot of people are afraid to speak up because they're worried about keeping their jobs. I hope that there is a dissent channel in every organization overseas where an American employee or an expat employee can go to and state what the problem is and the company will look into it. And I also think that the funding agencies, usually Department of State, Department of Defense, they need to be more involved with who's getting hired on these programs. Yes, next question. Uh, you, you presented your uh, moment of illumination in the mosque as though this were of universal validity. And of course, um, Muslims are not the only people who worship sexually segregated facilities. But there is the argument that there are certain, uh, undo undeniably, even among Muslim women, women who would be aroused by the sight of other women's buttocks in the air, and men who would be aroused by the sight of other men's buttocks in the air. <laughs> So why accept, uh, with unquestioningly, the cultural assumptions of the, the host country you're in? Well, you actually have an eye opener too. You are thinking beyond what many Americans have about fixed ideas about other cultures. I'm just saying that that day I went to the mosque just to have a mosque experience. I wasn't expecting that thing to happen. But I came out of the mosque feeling like the ignorant American. Like, why didn't I think of that? There's this practical issue. Because I'm a woman, and I'm, I'm feeling like, well, wh why can't I go in the front? I'd like to go pray in the front. OK, I'm not Muslim, so I'm not going to go pray in the front. But if I was, can I go pray in the front? So, so that's why I asked her that question, because she was a woman. And then I get this answer thrown back at me, and I'm, oh, I feel so ignorant. So that is what happened. Yes. You seem very sort of offended by these separate facilities and the separate DFAC, but did you ever actually go to the Afghan DFAC and eat with the Afghans? And also, how has this experience changed how you behave back in the U.S. and deal with cultural differences and uh, segregations that we may not want to admit are there? Okay, the DFAC issue, when I started realizing what was happening and how that whole defect issue actually started up for me is I'm seeing this separation. Okay, it's lunchtime. Okay, you're Afghan? Okay, you have to go over there. Si sorry, see you later. It, it was like that, okay? And then I go to my defect with my American friends. And then I'm sitting in the lunchroom eating my hamburger, my American meal, and I'm hearing the Americans at my table criticizing the Afghans, the Afghan staff. I don't understand the reasoning. I don't know why they don't get it. I'm asking so-and-so to do this. And then I thought, is, is this 
Is this how they perceive the Afghans? Could it be that in the Afghan defect, they're sitting around their table saying, well, you know, these Americans, they come here, they tell us this and they tell us that. I don't get this American. He thought I was in such and such tribe when I'm not that tribe at all. So when I started realizing what was happening, I thought, okay, why don't we make it where I'm going to ask the colleagues, the lawyers in my office, ask them tomorrow, let's all go to the Afghan defect. This is in Kabul in Newport. And join our Afghans and see what happens. Because we're allowed in there, but none of us go, right? Okay, so lunch hour the next day came. I stood up and I said, uh, do any of you, you guys, you know, their names are Michael, Jeff, James. Do you guys want to go with me? I'm going to join Mohammed and Hassan and Abdul in their defect. You want to go with me? We should go, we should go check it out to see what kind of food. My American friends went quiet. They looked at me. They did not say the word no. They looked at me. They went quiet. So I asked the question again in case they didn't hear me. And my Afghan staff at that point had already exited the room. So one of my colleagues stood up and said, I don't know what you're starting, but this isn't good. I'm going to lunch. The other one said, I got a little stomach problem. I'm, I'm going to head out to lunch over here. So without my American colleagues, I trotted over to the Afghan defect. Hey, you've got to check it out if you're wondering about this. So I go in, and my Afghan colleagues were waiting for me. And I noticed as soon as I entered, that cafeteria was very different inside than the ones that we Americans were using. It was much more, we could say the word down market, the fold-up tables, the fold-up chairs. And as I was saying, it's one entree per meal, no selection. So if you're a vegetarian, you're gluten-free or sodium-free, too bad. Okay, you, everybody gets the same entree. Fine, I am vegetarian. I got the entree anyway, sat down with my Afghan staff. And then I started to just discover who they actually were because then they started telling me little things about themselves. One of them, an Afghan judge, he said to me, Jade, I'm very glad you came and joined us because I always wanted to tell you, but I, I didn't want to tell you in the office. He says, I'm dating a Vietnamese girl online. She's my girlfriend. Okay, I'm not expecting this conversation in the Afghan defect. I, I didn't even know that Afghans over there were doing online dating with whoever in the world. I, I said, oh, she's your girlfriend. Are you going to go meet her? She sa he says, right on. So, so it's like this sort of, these kind of conversations, you start to get to know who is that person that has been translating for you, interpreting for you, driving you around, and then you build relationships. Because what's going to happen if you're in a car with them in Kabul and a bomb explodes and your car becomes disabled? You know how to get around in Kabul? You're going to be following that guy. Let's hope that guy doesn't betray you. Let's hope he cares about you and he's your friend. So you need to have this kind of bonding. And in Kunduz, we did, our staff in the Kunduz RTC, we did from time to time accompany our staff to the Afghan defect. Yes, Michael. Hi. Um, could you describe in those programs where you had to teach, what was done afterwards to assess the curriculum if it had any impact on imparting information the students could actually use? And if you, they was able to make an assessment, was it then used afterwards to try to improve the curriculum? Okay, the, um, the program, the curriculum, that assessment was ongoing. It wasn't until afterwards. Every week we had to write a weekly report that went to headquarters in Washington, D.C. that essentially had a graph how many Afghan students, how many of them were women, how many of them were judges, how many of them were police officers. I mean, you broke it down. And then during the week, we, the rule of law advisors, we would be going into the field, not just teaching in the classroom, we'd be going into the field, into the courthouses, into the prosecutor's office, into the police station, talking to the Afghans and asking them, how do you find the program? Is it helping you? 
And when I did a lot of that, I came to find that the Afghans, they were, I'm not saying that they're dishonest, I'm saying they, they don't really want to criticize our program. They want to be part of the program, they want to get this free training. So it was very difficult to extract the truth from them. But the weekly reports were very important because they documented what we did every week and they went to our DC office and eventually to State Department and then eventually shown to Congress. Yes. Hi, yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say I have appreciated so much hearing your experience as a woman in this field, let alone an Asian American woman. Oh, do I need to get closer? Okay, um, but I also wanted to hear your insights on how damaging kind of the almost prejudicial attitudes of American ignorance was to the soft power and soft diplomacy programs that you were having there and how that might have changed since that attitude has since uh, been widely publicized by our administration. Okay, well, as I'm saying, particularly in any rule of law program, when we Americans are doing rule of law program, we're, the message is law is important. No one is above the law. And when we are doing it, we are, we are pushing the concepts of equality, gender equality, transparency, accountability. And when I'm not seeing the equality happening on the compound, I'm troubled because it's not only happening in front of me, it's happening in front of the local staff. It's also happening in front of the students and anybody else on the compound who's watching, including the gate guards and the driver and the security detail. And I am very sure that each one of them, when they leave the compound in the evening and they go back to their villages and their home, they have statements to make about us Americans to their communities. And when they continue to report to our program because they either work here or they are getting free training, I have to question how seriously are they taking what we say when we are teaching one thing and not always practicing it. So that is my message. Yes. Hi, um, I'm a public school teacher and I was wondering if you could make application to what you're talking about with foreign communities interacting and the way that a lot of times in our country or even in our classrooms, there's very distinct communities that may not um, interact. And, you know, being an American overseas, you have more, um, you know, that is an American program. So you might have more uh, leeway in implementing uh, equality because you're American. So I was just wondering if you could make application to interactions in America? Well, from what I have seen of the different classrooms, especially in the, um, the kids, the K through 12 or secondary school level, of course, we in America have more organized, have a more organized setting, a more organized schedule. And um, over there, well, where I was teaching in Malawi, it was less organized. Although on paper, we had a schedule and we had national exams at the end of the school year. Um, but what I could say is that I saw a lot more boys attending school overseas. And in the adult area, more men coming to class than women. And of course, as American teachers, we're trying to equalize that, like where, where are the girls, why aren't they coming? Or where are the women, why aren't they coming? Actually, I have a whole chapter in my book about the women <coughs> in Kunduz who were trying to come into our Kunduz RTC to be part of the rule of law program. And the problem was they arrived, they came, but at the gate of the Kunduz RTC, they were searched by male gate guards. And I didn't know that at first because nobody told me about it. And then as this was continuing to happen, finally, one day when I met with the Afghan women, I said, how do you, how do you feel about our program? They said to me, you know, it is difficult for us to come out of the house, to come all the way to your camp. Now, when we're here at the door, we're running through, running into red tape every step of the way. We're searched by male gate guards. And then once we enter, there are no female bathrooms. And 
and then we have the problem with, with the lunch thing, the defect, okay? They're not internationals, so they're not gonna be, they're not international, they're not Afghan staff, so they're not gonna be allowed into international defect, so they're relegated to the Afghan defect because they're students. But then, remember, I said in Kunduz, we had 750 men, the majority of, majority of them were the Afghan police trainees. So when the few Afghan women went into this Afghan defect, they were leered at, they were shouted at, so they came out. So the labor-intensive workaround solution that I saw happening on the Kunduz RTC <laughs> was our program let them have an empty connex, you know those U-Haul containers we live in overseas? Well, an, an American resigned, so the Afghan women were told, okay, you can go in here, eat your lunch in here, there's also a bathroom in the connex, you can use that. And I went several times to talk to the manager about this, and he said, well, you know, do, why do we have to build new bathrooms? Why do we have to build any new facilities for Afghan women? He said, um, you know, they can come, for the bathroom issue, they can come and use the unisex bathroom on the international side of the camp. And I said, sir, I don't think they're gonna cross that dirt road to come into the international side of the camp to use the restroom. They're not comfortable with it. And besides that restroom, a lot of German soldiers are queuing up to use it. I don't see traditional village Afghan women queuing up with German soldiers to use a unisex restroom. So there weren't a whole lot of things done. And then we had the bureaucracy issue. If we're gonna build something, who's gonna fund it? Who's gonna who's gonna be allowed to use it. So there were those problems that were never resolved the entire time I was there. That was a problem. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.